course starts out with the basics of supply and demand. What constitutes a demand curve? What constitutes a supply curve? How they interact and how their interaction <laughs> creates wealth for society. And by the way, to do that, we have experiments where we have you act as market actors. You know, there's jokes about psychologists use rats to, um, for their experiments. And of course, economists use freshmen because, well, we were growing too attached to the rats. And so it'll be your turn to act as the rats and be in simulated markets where you too will have economic decisions. And so hopefully through those, uh, through those uh, uh, experiments, you will understand how our, at least our idealized markets work and how markets create wealth. Of course, many of you already partake in markets. You sell your labor, you buy various goods, you buy cars, you buy bread, you, you may buy stocks. You probably don't buy oil and gas commodities on the New York Mercantile Exchange, but those are similar markets. The second issue we talked about, which is crucial to environmental ec economics, is how markets fail how they fail to create the perfect market. And there are several basic market failures that we're going to talk about, the most important of which is simple, what we call externalities, but what you'll think about is pollution. I run a steel mill. I create steel, which is useful in so many ways in our modern society. But I also emit a lot of pollution into the air, poisoning people's lungs. I emit pollution into the water, killing fish, harming people's water quality. I can do a lot of bad things. Another issue we'll talk about are what are called common pools. The most obvious issues of those are involves hunting and fishing. Many of my students grow up in rural Pennsylvania and they have, they have hunting and fishing as family traditions. So they get up early in the morning and they paint themselves with deer urine or something like that. And they go hide out in the woods with large guns and, uh, with, and they're ready to shoot these poor animals who wander by on the first day of hunting season. Now everyone's tastes differ. This doesn't sound like fun to me, but I know lots of my students like it. On the other hand, they think I'm odd when I talk about how much fun I have curling. So, um, you know, different tastes different. But if you think about these common pool issues, what are called common pools, what's a common pool? Well, think about this deer. Nobody owns the deer until it's dead, which gives people lots of incentives to kill deer or other wildlife that are actually scarce, or fish, for instance. So, for instance, if you think about issues about saving whale habitat, well, nobody owns whales. And so 30 years ago, whales were on the verge of being extinct because the only way to own a whale was to kill it. Nowadays, society has moved forward to that, and we've made some progress on these issues. The third issue that we'll talk about a little bit is the idea of consumer deception in environmental products. How do you know that a detergent is environmentally friendly? I, of course, try to get the special fish killing detergent that will maximize the number of fish killed when I do my wash. However, you, on the other hand, may have less perverse taste and desire to have an environmentally friendly detergent. How do you know that it's really a good detergent? Do you think about that? So now we have a market, and we have market failures, and we look to government to solve these problems. But the problem with government, as I think you know, is that government is less than perfect. And this all starts with voting. Have you ever wondered why you vote? Couldn't be because you think you're going to affect the uh, election. No one ever wins an election by one vote. You know that. So why do you vote? Well, we can talk about a variety of reasons. Okay, but since, you don't re since your vote doesn't matter, you don't really invest in learning about politicians. So they try to get your attention by having all kinds of highly sophisticated and yet perfectly sophisticated campaign commercials with almost no substance at all. And then when they get to office, are they interested in standing up for your interest or being reelected and appearing to look good on cameras like I'm on? Politicians specialize in looking good at cameras. Well, you've watched me for a few minutes. Do you think I should be a politician? Probably not. So we talk about how governments fail. And then we'll try to apply that to a variety of circumstances. In particular, we'll talk about 
what uh, is now called cap and trade programs, the, the economist solution to environmental problems, where we give people rights to pollution and allow them to trade. And according to our theory, and according to our classroom exercise, which I hope we're going to do in class, that brings about our pollution reductions at the lowest cost to society. And we'll talk about a variety of issues of how they work, how they create wealth, and even sometimes about how maybe you're not they're very moral. Of course, I told you I'm an economist. I'm amoral. I'm not interested in morality. But you, as a typical human being, may well be interested in morality. And finally, we'll talk about energy issues. Energy issues are very big in our society. The price of oil jumps up and down. So in 1998, when I first came to Penn State, the oil cost about $12 a barrel. In 1998, in, in 2008, it cost $140 a barrel. Now it costs about $64 a barrel. It goes up and down and all around. It has all kinds of implications for society. We'll talk about if we're running out of oil, if there are other forms of energy, and what we should do, if anything, to address our oil, issue, our oil and energy supply issues.